Praise the Lord. Praise God. Just give me a moment, folks. This is a holiday weekend. Say amen. 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 I just want to give something for you to think about. with our eyes, 
which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was from the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now if you notice the last portion of verse 2, I'm reading by the way from the King James Version. You'll notice it says, uh, we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I want to touch just a moment on this. I'm not actually preaching on this portion of Scripture, but I believe, I believe with all my heart this morning that even into eternity, that the main, the main focus, as John wrote in, in his third book, the main focus is the Father and the Son. For from the Father and the Son come eternal life. Now, eternity is eternal life. Anytime we talk about eternity, we talk about eternal life. And this morning, I'd like to use as a theme, if I may, I had thought about using the first day of eternity. But I, I've changed that because uh, some people may get confused and say, Pastor, in eternity, there won't be any 24-hour days. As far as we know, there won't. But at any rate, we changed it when eternity begins. When eternity begins. I want to just read something to you because Brother Joe Adams was a long-winded preacher. But he was a good preacher. How many know that I'm also a long-winded preacher? Amen. <laughs> Somebody handed me this, I think, to remind me. I like, no, they, they just did it. They didn't even know I was going to read it, but I thought it was cute. The small town had experienced rapid growth, and the local church congregation had outgrown their building, reports R. W. Hummel of Sigamore Hills, Ohio. The members formed a committee to plan and build a new building. The committee told the minister to take care of the flock, and they would handle all the details of church construction. The minister complied with the request and kept his distance. As the new building was nearing completion, the committee chairman invited the minister to view their new house of worship. Entering through the main doors, the minister noted only the last row of pews had been installed. That's the last row at the back of the auditorium. Since people always fill the last pew first, we have a special feature installed, the chairman of the committee said. He pressed a button on the wall, and the pews in the back row moved forward, and another row popped up. <laughs> the minister was duly impressed. The big day finally arrived for the first service in the new church. The minister peeked out as the pews filled, and row after row after row popped up out of the floor, in the back, and then in the front and all moved forward. He was ecstatic. When the time came for the sermon, the minister was so filled with joy and goodwill, he delivered his prepared message and then some. At 12 o'clock, he was still sharing the good word, and the church bells began to ring, and the pulpit and the minister slowly descended. <laughs> That's got to be me. <laughs> Thank God. But Revelation chapter 21, we're going to be preaching from this portion of Scripture, not the whole chapter, but from a few various uh, verses throughout that chapter. Over the triple doorway of the Cathedral of Milan, there are three inscriptions spanning the splendid arches. 
Over one is carved a beautiful wreath of roses. And underneath is a legend, all that pleases is but for a moment. Over the other is sculptured a cross, and these are the words beneath. All that troubles is but for a moment. But underneath the great central entrance in the main aisle is the inscription, that only is important, which is eternal. Can you say that? Amen. When eternity begins, one of these days, I'm leaving the Air Jordans. And I'm going up. Amen. I'm going to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. And you know, sometimes I think we're tempted, ladies and gentlemen, to think that that's sort of the consummation of everything. That that's the beginning. Uh, that's just the beginning of, of our eternal life as we'll know it. And that that's the way it's going to be. But that is not the beginning of our eternal life as we're going to know it. There are a lot of things that have to happen before eternity begins for the Christian. There's a lot of things that have to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think about it this morning. And by the way, write this in your notes. And, and those who aren't in church today, invite them back. Next Sunday, I'd like to see this church packed. I'm going to be preaching on the judgment of the believer. It is one of the most... Uh, comprehensive messages I have ever preached on this subject. And I would love for all of our church family to hear this. The judgment of the believing Christian next Sunday morning. Ladies and gentlemen, think about this. The Lord has returned. The rapture of the church has taken place. The terrible tribulation is over. The battle of Armageddon is done. The return and righteous reign of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, for 1,000 years is now living history. I'm talking in the future now. Satan is bound during those 1,000 years and then loosed for a short season. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. Here's what it says in the King James Version. And when the thousand years are expired, and by the way, before I read that, let me finish my statement. Satan is bound during those 1,000 years and then loosed for a short season. Then bound and cast into the lake of fire with the beast, and with a false prophet forever. Here's what it says, verses 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters, four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the seas. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, all this, let's say, all this is past. The judgment of the nations is past. The sinners, all who have ever lived, will be brought before the great white throne judgment. Now I have referred to the white throne judgment on various occasions in the last messages that I have been preaching. But I have just finished a message just on the white throne judgment. Completely on that judgment bar. And I'll be presenting that or preaching that in the weeks ahead. It is something that, ladies and gentlemen, I believe it, it did me when I was writing it and studying it. It caused the hair on my neck to stand up. When I begin to realize the things that are going to happen in the future. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Don't you? Amen. I want to be saved. I want the blood to be covering my life. I'll tell you folks, 
In this age in which we live, on Sundays, it's no time to buy a car. It's no time to go out and golf. I'm sorry, I've got to say this. It's no time to mess around and use our Sundays uh, to do this or do that when we ought to prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus Christ. The philosophy of the church has changed so drastically. As long as we enter in and come to worship, it doesn't matter what we do the rest of the week. But it does matter. Amen. It does matter. And it's very important to our future and to the future of our eternal existence. You see, ladies and gentlemen, all who have ever lived, the sinner will be brought before the great white throne judgment and sentenced to hell. I want to read verses 11 through 14, 15 in chapter 20 of Revelation. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up their dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I agree with Brother Joe. And you know in the past year especially, I've been preaching on these subjects. But I agreed with our Brother Joe when he said hell is not preached on enough in our churches anymore. We need to realize just as sure as there's a heaven to gain, ladies and gentlemen, there's a hell to shun. And we must be ready when Jesus comes. Just listen to it. All these things that I just mentioned to you are past. Talking about the future. But during all these things, the tribulation period, the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. <coughs> all those who are brought at the rapture will gather about that great, ta great table that spans the universe and partake together <coughs> Again, with the Lord Jesus Christ at the head of the table. But before that supper, while all this is going on, is the judgment of the believer. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. How many believes in that? Yes, amen. How many believes are going to be one? Yes. I'll tell you, folks, these are two big things that are going to happen after the rapture. First, the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me tell you something. When somebody gets married, they don't receive, they don't receive their gifts when they go to the courthouse to get their license. <coughs> they receive their gifts at the reception. At the place, the marriage supper. That's where they receive. That's exactly how it's going to be done. We'll be judged first and then receive our rewards <coughs> and sit about that marriage supper. All these things, the marriage supper of the Lamb is finished. The judgment seat of Christ is quiet and still. No more judgment there. Listen to me. Sin has made its final blemish. No more will sin ever blemish. Then, ladies and gentlemen, Eternity begin. Someone has said these words, in this world life becomes a new and thrilling thing, but in the world to come eternal life with God becomes a certainty. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. Let's look into this, uh, this important message this morning. Eternity now begins. Glory to God. Don't you dare miss it. That's why I've been preaching. Don't miss the rapture. 
Brother Joe didn't want to preach on, on the things he preached on. And I'm not trying to rehearse what he, what he has won over or, or uh, bring it before you again. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, there are places we don't want to be found when Jesus comes. I'm convinced of it. I don't think Jesus is going to come to the dance floor and hunt you out if the rapture takes place. I know that's, that's really getting down to the old-fashioned preacher, but I'll tell you folks, my mom always told me when I walked out the door the second time that she was better than the first. And I started studying for the ministry. She said, I want to remind you of one thing, young man. I said, yes, ma'am. See, I always called her yes, ma'am and no, ma'am. If I said anything else, I paid for it. Yes, ma'am. She says, if you ever have a question about doing anything, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't even give it a second consideration. Just don't do it. Then you don't have to ask forgiveness for it. Can you say amen? Amen. You don't have to plead the blood on it. It's called living a life of holiness. Some people have different words for it. I've heard people call it... Uh, being, what is that word? When you really go overboard? Fanatic. A fanatic, yeah. I've heard people call it fanaticism. And there are forms of fanaticism. I agree. There are forms of fanaticism. But ladies and gentlemen, although we serve a loving God and a righteous God, I believe this does not only apply to us as parents and adults and senior citizens. And I'm now a senior citizen. I'm getting stuff cut off my prices. I'm losing my hair, losing my teeth. But I'll tell you, I'm getting lower prices. I thank God for that. But what I'm saying this morning doesn't only apply to us senior citizens and adults. It applies to these kids. The Word of God has not changed. It is still the same. And when, once we get to the age of accountability, when that rapture takes place, any young kid that is of the age of accountability, I mean, knows the difference between right and wrong, and can actually ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins, if they are in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it's not under the blood, they'll miss the rapture. Yes, right. 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 I don't care if you attend church every day. I got a scripture in my message this morning that applies to it. Number one, when eternity begins, there will be the revelation of the new city and its mystery. Over in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, it says these words, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, <coughs> adorned for her husband. Someone has said, join thyself to the eternal God, and thou shalt be eternal. There is only one way to get to heaven. And, and I, I tell you folks, it's hard for me. I've got to discipline my mind. I've got to discipline my body. I've got to discipline my thought life. You say, Pastor, boy, I wish I could be like you and never think about anything bad <laughs> or ever have any temptation. Ladies and gentlemen, I probably have as much temptation as you do or more. There's times when stuff runs through my mind that makes me shiver. And I have to say, God, cleanse my mind. Get this filthy stuff out of my mind. Cleanse my body. Cleanse my eyesight. Cleanse my ears. Cleanse my mouth. What if you come, Jesus? Help me to be ready. How many agree with what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, folks, I know it's stiff, but I'll say it. My Bible tells me when Jesus comes back, He's coming back for people that have white robes on. And these ropes have no wrinkles in them. 
No spots on them. Spotless robes. <coughs> now I agree, there's only one way to get the wrinkles out and the spots out, and that is to have the blood applied. Yeah. You've got to plead the blood. But I'll tell you this, folks. I'm a firm believer of this. We cannot keep going out and committing the same sin over and over and over again, coming back to God, saying, God, I'm sorry. One of these times, God's going to cut it off. Amen. I don't know when that is. I don't know if it ever is. I just know that you can't tamper with the grace of God. You can't play with it. We must obey and respect the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just... Uh, Put one added thing there. Somebody's going out of church, I know, and give me a call tomorrow. Oh, pastor, am I going to hell? I had a bad thought. No. I think that the bad thoughts going through your mind is not what damns you. It's letting those thoughts stay there. And letting them build in your mind and in your heart until they take over your body and take over your character. Unless that's under the blood. I believe, I don't know about you folks, but I believe there is no sin going to enter into heaven. No sin. No unconfessed sin. I can't carry, St. Paul talked about getting rid of the excess baggage behind me. I cannot go to heaven dragging that dirty bag. No. How many agree? You can't, well, Pastor, you just don't know my circumstances. My Bible tells me that there's nothing that you went through that my Jesus hasn't already went through on the He knows all of your hurts and all of your pains and all of your sin. For He bore every sin that every individual would ever commit on His life on the cross for all time and eternity. Yes. For all. Everything. He bore the immorality. You think about it, folks. He bore the, 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 the works of homosexuality. You know, nobody preaches that. Jesus, when you say, well, well, I wonder when homosexuality started, Pastor. It was prevalent in Jesus' time. Very prevalent. It was prevalent way before Jesus' time. It was prevalent during Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what brought the fire down on those cities. That's what enticed Lot. And that's what destroyed his wife. Jesus died on the cross for every single homosexual that will ever live. If they'll confess their sin and turn from it, they can be saved and on their way to heaven. Every lesbian. Every effeminate individual. I'll talk. I'm getting ahead of myself. My Lord, I only got 15 minutes. You people better stay a little while. Are you with me? This is point number one. Praise God. I want you to look to 2 Peter, if you will. 2 Peter chapter 3. Just a couple verses here. Three verses, 11 through 13. Here's what it says. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. That's talking about, remember what I talked about between between the end of the thousand years and then the white throne judgment and then the new heaven and the new earth, there's going to be a, a great fire on this earth. How many's ever heard about that? I hear people scared. There's people talking to me this week about uh, uh, somebody come up to me yesterday. I, I gotta tell you this. These cicadas, is that what you call them? I would call them locusts. Locusts. Yeah. You call them cicadas? Locusts. They said for 17 years ago that they had a pee on their wings. Stood for peace. Somebody told me this yesterday. I haven't looked at one yet. I, I match them, right? I'm so busy matching them. Yeah. I don't have time to look for them. Man, they crack too when you hit them. How many times have you got to ask a question? I'm just kidding. I'm just 17 years ago, this guy stood in the parking lot and said, they had a pee on their wings, stood for peace. The world was in pretty well peace. And he said, if you could look on the bottom of their wing, there was a pee. He said, these that are coming out have a W on them, standing for war. He said, I wonder what's next. I said, H for Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pastor, really, really? I said, oh, you never know, brother. It's going to get bad around here. If you're not ready when Jesus comes, things are going to get hot. How many believe it? 
Bible says that the earth is going to melt under a fervent heat. We talk about a nuclear holocaust. Most of this world will be on fire at once. The very rocks will melt. The Bible says men will run to hide with no place to hide. All this happens, see, after the thousand years of peace. Listen to this. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation, that's lifestyle, and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord. That's the, the day of the Lord. You know what the day of the Lord is? The beginning of the day of the Lord is the rapture of the saints. That marks the beginning of the day of the Lord. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. I just told you that. And the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to His promise. Peter wrote this. Look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That ought to make us shout for joy. No, we don't have to go through that. And we're ready for Jesus. Pastor, aren't people going to be saved during the tribulation? If I miss the rapture, it'll be all right. I'll be able to make it as long as I don't take the mark of the beast. You don't take the mark of the beast, they'll kill you anyway. That's the only way you can be saved, is shed your blood during the tribulation period. If we can't live for Jesus now, how in God's name can we live for Him under the tribulation? You're with me, aren't you? Amen. Number two. I'm not saying you can't move for it. That is a matter of speech. I want you to notice the book of Isaiah. Chapter 65. One verse. Verse 17. Here's what it says. King James Version. For behold, I create new heavens. This was written by Isaiah. Way back in the Old Testament. For behold, I create new heavens. And a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Number two, not only, ladies and gentlemen, I want to keep track of what I'm doing here, not only will there be a revelation of the new city, and the mystery of that city, and the place we'll live for eternity, but secondly, when eternity begins, notice the residence of the beautiful mansions that are in the new Jerusalem. Verse 3 of chapter 21 of Revelation says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I want you to see something. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 14 through 18. Remember the residence of this beautiful city, the New Jerusalem. Here's what it says, beginning with verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Amen. What does it mean, preacher? I gotta go out, I gotta go to work. That's not what it means. I gotta go to the grocery store and I've got to buy milk and bread. That's not what it means. I've got to go down the road and buy gas at the gas station down here. And that guy cusses like I don't know what. That's not what it means. It means hanging out. I want you to hear me. It means hanging out with people who don't respect and live for God. Amen. You've got to rub shoulders with the world. But I'll tell you, folks, you hang out with the wrong people and you'll become like them. That's right. That's right. I'll guarantee you. And that's why the Bible warns us, be ye not un unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Or what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial, with hell, with Satan? Or what part hath he, hath he that believeth with an infidel? 
and one agreement hath the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, verse 17, this is old-fashioned preaching, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you. How many believe it? Yeah. It's awful weak. Yeah, that's the truth. You cannot mess with the world. Oh, I'm ready for the rapture. And you can't go out and mess around with the world and expect that you're ready for Jesus. It just doesn't work. What if I make a mistake? There's a big difference between a mistake in judgment or action and a deliberate act. There's a big difference. Yeah. I believe God's grace automatically in many cases covers yes. covers our mistakes. His blood continually flows. But that deliberate act, we've got to confess that. Get it under the blood. <clears throat> Number three. Not only have we talked about at the beginning of eternity, the revelation of the new city and its mystery, the residence of the mansions of that city, but thirdly, there will be no more bad memories. I, I think this might answer some questions for some folks here in the church. Somebody the other day said, I wonder if I wonder if my mother can watch what I'm doing down here. If she's up with the Lord. Verse 3 of the book of Revelation says these words. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Hallelujah. Verses 4 and 5. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. That probably ought to be enough. But I had to go back again into the book of Isaiah. And I want to share with you again the verse in 65, Isaiah 65 and verse 17. These are powerful words. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Amen. That will be enough to tell us. But that's not enough. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 10 says, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. There's been questions. I'm going to, I'm going to be a little, get in, delve in a little bit probably in uncharted territory here for just a moment. But folks, I have... I believe that as I look at the Word of God that I have to share this with you. There's been times when folks have said, you know, my mother came and visited me since she died. I saw her. She was in the room with me. Or my relative. And this person being a Christian and the person who died was a Christian. Folks, I want to tell you something. As much as we would like for that to happen, it's impossible for And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says the former things will be forgotten. When they get to heaven, we're going to remember the good things, the godly things. Only things that attribute to our existence there. We're going to know each other. The Bible says you'll know as you have known. But it does not mean you'll know like you knew when you stood in the living room and slapped your wife. 
Kind of do something a little easier. Or maybe, uh, maybe uh, got in a fight uh, when you were sitting outside the bar. I, I'm being extreme here. But folks, I believe when we get to heaven, there'll be no more sighing. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more heartache. We'll remember nothing that was ungodly or unrighteous. And I'm not sure how much we'll remember about down here of anything. I believe our existence is going to be so caught up with our loved ones in the sight of God that we're going to be so filled with His glory and so filled with His righteousness that our time is going to be taken up in worshiping Him. The Bible says we will proclaim as the, as the waves of the sea, millions upon millions, Almighty God, Thou holy God, O Lamb of God, that taketh away the sins of the world. Almighty Father, we love You. We worship You, O Lamb of God, that taketh away. Not going to be, according to what the word says, you're not going to be able to remember these kind of things that have happened to you. Remember it. I'm going to get to another very, very serious thing here. You're probably going to have to get a tape or something and go back over this when you get home because I know this is rather deep. I do remember something someone said He who has no vision of eternity will never get a true hold on time. How true that is. If we have no vision of eternity, time will not be important to us. Never. Thirdly, or fourthly, I'm sorry, there will be no more unsaved. Here's the, here's the important thing that I want you to hear. Right here. When eternity begins, there will be no unsaved family or friends there. Let's let that sink in just for a moment. Pastor, I, I'm not saying you said this, but you know, just what if. I'm tired of praying for my family. Seems like they don't want anything to do with God. Don't stop praying for your family. Don't stop praying for that husband who has refused to acknowledge Christ as his personal Savior. Don't quit praying for that wife who has refused to acknowledge Christ. Those kids who have refused to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Don't look at When we get into eternity, they won't be with us. We'll never see them. When we leave this world, if they're unsaved and they die, We'll never see them again. Ever. We'll never think of them again. There'll be no more thought of them. No remembrance. Absolutely none. Does everybody understand this? Yes. Verse 8 of Revelation 21 says, But the fearful and the unbelieving... Uh, I'll stop there a second. Here's, you know, when you look at this scripture, you can say, well, my relatives aren't that bad, Pastor. They don't do those kind of things. But if they miss the rapture, or they don't go to heaven, they've done one of them. The Bible says the fearful, secondly, the unbelieving. That's enough to send you to hell. How many agree? Unbelief is enough to send you to hell. Yeah, that's right. You don't have to shoot somebody with a gun or commit adultery. All you have to do is not believe Jesus Christ can be your Savior and you'll never, never, never go to heaven. That's how serious it is. Verse 8 says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, here's what it says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. People will tell you today, you're okay. It's all right. You can just finagle your way. You can, and I, we love 
any church loves people that give. But I'll tell you, any pastor or any church that lets people believe they can pay their way into heaven is fooling themselves. You cannot do it. I don't care how much we give to God. It won't get us to heaven. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor uh, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, folks, let me, I'm going to get a little bit uh, graphic. Yes, that's a good word. Thank you, whoever, whoever said that. My Bible says if a man wants to dress and act like a woman, that's what the word effeminate means. Or if he wants to take the place of a woman. That's called homosexuality. Or if they both are involved in defacing the human body through those actions, they shall not inherit unless they repent. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How many believe that's what you're doing? That's the word of God. Now you won't find a lot of churches maybe preach that. But it's the truth. Hey, I was, I've had, I, I heard a man stand in our general council, one of our assembly of God pastor, and say, I can preach against homosexuality. My church needs $1.3 million per year just to exist. And if I preach against it, I'll lose those books. I don't know how you can afford it not to. I don't know how we can afford not to stand for what's right. Don't you think the devil doesn't fight me when we're building this building over here? And we're, we've, got, we've got a responsibility ahead of us financially. God's going to help us with that. He's going to help us take care of that. But I'll tell you something, folks. If I let down the guard now, I don't believe this church will stand. I believe in this last day we need to preach it. Amen. Hey, well, Pastor, well, you're just, well, you know what? I was in the hospital. Well, that's money. I, I won't say that. Something crossed my mind. A lady dropped her teeth on the floor. And, and that looked like the thing she had. Sorry, that came across my <laughs> That wasn't very godly either. But... <laughs> Folks, listen to me. Listen to me. Pastor, you mean to tell me that I degrade? I degrade these type of people that practice these things? No. I used to do it. It used to make me so mad inside. I'll tell you, folks, I wanted to do something bad to them. Because several of them, when I was in New York City, just as a young kid, when they come up, a homosexual comes up and gets his arm in your arm and invites you to go home with him. And just, it's just the way they do. And I'm telling you, folks, it just put such a hatred in me for that type of lifestyle. God had to deal with it and said, how can you preach the grace of God if you can't see beyond their sin and see God's grace? I'm able to save them. And you know, since that, since I asked the Lord to do that, I had funerals for homosexuals. They were no longer homosexuals when they died. They died of AIDS. All five of them died of AIDS. All five of them, I never told you, maybe I should have, came into this room <coughs> and sat in this pew at various times. Not this one. <laughs> set in one of these people. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. My wife would worry one came to the platform one day, dying of age, put his arms around me. He was saved. He didn't do it for the wrong reason. He come to this platform on a Sunday night, wrapped his arms around me, and, and just gave me a kiss on the neck. And I know it wasn't wrong on his part. He just loved me. He said, Thank you for saving me. Well, I didn't save him. God did. And I told him that. Rose, boy, she went, oh, honey, honey, what's going on? No. 
Why should I worry about that? Nothing's going to happen. I, got, I know church, I know we got to do things, but you know we spend too much time doing, I know Assembly God Church was going to write legal books. We're going to say, well, I think you should have precautions. But folks, we want to see people get saved. We built this, spot, this church over here, and we close our doors to anybody. We'll pay the penalty. We'll pay the penalty. But what I'm trying to bring out to you this morning is we cannot live these type of lifestyles. We can't, and I don't want to go too far with this because I'm one that doesn't preach about clothes, but I'll tell you, we can't look extremely like the world. We can't do some of the things that, that these people do in the world. Uh, listen, just because the world dyes their hair orange doesn't mean the Christian has to follow suit. Somewhere along the line, we have to draw a line. Come ye out from among them and be the servants and touch not them. Definitely just about done. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a high point in the, in the message. When eternity begins, the Lamb shall reign forever. The Lamb shall reign forever. I want you to notice over in verses 22 and 23 of chapter 21 of Revelation. I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know something this morning. The Lamb of God is going to be ruling and reigning in this new Jerusalem. John chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, uh, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation of the, is of, of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And if we can't practice it here, how in the world will we practice it there? Amen. Isaiah 24, 23 says, this is a a direct confirmation of prophecy about the book of Revelation. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before His ancient lords. You know what it means? I'll tell you what it means. It means when Jesus becomes the center of attraction in New Jerusalem, there will be no more need of the sun, or of the moon, or of the stars. For the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world shall reign so Hallelujah. Let us worship Him in spirit and in truth. I close with this. Number six. When eternity begins, there are only three requirements for getting there. Now, what other people may tell you, there are only three. Verse 27 of Revelation chapter 21 says these words. Let me find it. There shall in no wise enter into it the new, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or make of the life, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name there? 
Anyone in this church not sure? Is your name there? Do you know that you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart and asked Him to save you from your sins and become a born again Christian? The Bible says until that happens, your name is not in that book. And even at the white throne judgment, when they open that book to make sure every name that's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be immediately cast into hell. That's the word. That's the word. Here are the three things to remember, ladies and gentlemen. Number one, only the blood-washed Christian will be. You can't go on your works. No matter how good you are, you can't go to heaven on your works. Works follow conversion. They don't come before. Secondly, only Bible-believing Christians will be there. If I can't believe in the Word here, how can I live before? And thirdly, only born-again believers through the Holy Spirit. I want you to bow your head with me, please. Henry Van Dyke said these words, there is only one way to get ready for immortality, and that is to love this life, to live it as bravely and faithfully for God and cheerfully as we can, through His grace and through His blood. Are you ready for eternity? There's a lot has to happen, ladies and gentlemen. The rapture, the day of the Lord begins with the rapture. A lot has to happen. Are you ready to meet the Lord? As the organist and pianist plays quietly this morning, maybe somebody in this audience would say, Pastor, I've never understood this until today. I didn't realize that just going to church won't get me to heaven. Just believing that there's a God won't get me to heaven. But I've got to confess Him and ask Him to wash my sins away and make me a new creature. And then live a life of holiness before Him. Here's the one. Pray for me. Pray for me. I'm right with God. But the rapture should take place. I will Is there one? Would you stand with me this morning? My desire for my own heart is that Jesus' blood can be washed. Would you take somebody's hand and ask you to pray as a family? Maybe there's a loved one that you need to pray for today. Let's pray for them. Let's pray that God's grace will reach to them before it's eternally too late. Let's ask the love of Jesus to reach out. What if Jesus these things will begin? Heavenly Father, this morning, wash us afresh in your blood. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, oh God, we pray. We need your touch on this holiday weekend. There may be some in this audience today that may be tempted over this holiday to get involved in something they should not. Anything happened in this message today? Let it remind them we must live a holy life. Keep us pure before you, Jesus. Forgive us if we have sinned and cleanse us from all our righteousness. We ask you to protect our church. Bless our families, Lord. Many will start traveling already. Some have left this morning and are traveling. Be with them and keep them safe. Lord Jesus, bring us back again tonight. In your holy name.
Thank you, Jesus. Cover us with your blood. Cover us with your blood.